Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Avoiding Data Breaches in 2016, What You Need to Know. My name is Raleigh Gould, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Our featured speakers are David Monahan, Research Director of Risk and Security Management at EMA, and David Kramer, VP of Product Management at BMC. David Monahan's in-depth security experience, which spans over 20 years, has included organizing and managing physical and information security programs, including security and network operations for organizations ranging from Fortune 100 companies to local government. David Kramer serves as Vice President of Product Management for the Cloud DCA Business Unit. Prior to BMC, David was Head of Product Management for CA Technologies. During his tenure there, David was responsible for application delivery, cloud management, virtualization, and infrastructure automation solutions. And before I hand things over to today's featured speakers, I did want today's audience to know that we will be concluding today's event by taking your questions. You can log those at any time throughout the course of the presentation by using the Q&A functionality. Also, today's event is being recorded, and you will receive a follow-up email from EMA tomorrow that will include the on-demand playback, a PDF of the speaker slides, as well as some additional resources. So I encourage you to check that out. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our first featured speaker, David Kramer. David? Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, have a real interesting uh, presentation for you that David and I will take you through and um, we'll get started right now. All right, there we go. Sorry about that, had to learn how to change the slide. Um, so to kick things off, you know, the first slide here talks about the fact that we live in an increasingly digital world. And, you know, there's, there's signs of this everywhere in our lives. You know, all the things that we're now doing on mobile devices, phones and tablets, and the way that work and access to work have now kind of blended into our personal lives. Um, and this digital world that, you know, a lot of companies are talking about has a lot of interesting impacts to the security world and to protection of the assets that, you know, large enterprises and new enterprises have. And that's really going to be a big focus uh, of our discussion today is around, you know, what digitization has, has done or what it means. And more importantly, what are the impacts to security of your applications, your data, your infrastructure? And on this Absolutely. next slide, David. Oh, thanks. Go ahead. No, no, absolutely, and I think I think there's uh, issues that we see in the news every day about that. I mean, for example, uh, a current issue that we're seeing with the uh, Apple iPhone and the government trying to unlock it or getting Apple to unlock it, and you know that has to do with with uh, kind of a tangent to what we're talking about today. But it is about our our digital world and our and our digital security. And one of the things I wanted to to bring up in this particular slide, I, I think, is absolutely with with the graphic here is uh, about the the frog in the pot, right? The the old ad is that if you put a frog in a pot of cold water and you heat it up slowly. He'll uh, he'll cook, and if you don't, he'll he'll jump out, right? Because he realizes that it's hot, and I think we've been having that situation occur with us in the cyber world for some time now. Because uh, from my perspective, having been in operations for 20 years before I became an analyst, I uh, I saw that security oftentimes was was more of an afterthought or an obligation. You know, it, for for many businesses, it was uh, like an insurance policy. Right? We'll put money into it because we have to, uh, because of either compliance or whatever, or to, to show that we're doing our, our, our minimum diligence, if you will. I won't even say due diligence. Uh, but over the last couple of years, especially, we've seen a, a very big wake-up call, uh, 2014 being the year of the breach and 2015 coming very, very close to it as well in terms of the number of breaches uh, and, and the size of breaches that we've had. Uh, caused a lot of companies to, to reevaluate their stance on security. And, and they realize that they've had a potential a huge loss you know, on their doorstep. The ones who've actually had problems, whether it's your, your targets or your home depots or, or, or whatever, right? There's been quite a few different ones. They've, they've uh, spent a lot of money. They've lost money from brand confidence and in revenue. Uh, and so we're seeing a significant increase in, in IT uh, budget spending, specifically on security over the last couple of years. As you can see here in my, in my middle bullet, 51% of organizations are spending between 10 and 24% 
of their IT budgets on security. I think at the lower end there, you're seeing just uh, kind of a normal increase in, in response. But when you get to the higher end of that 24%, and even in that last bullet, when you see between 20 and 30% of uh, IT spending being spent on security, uh, you've got a, a catch-up situation. And so, so companies that had neglected security uh, to make it a priority, thinking, that, hey, you know, that day will never come, if you will, uh, or doomsday will never come, they, they've realized that, yes, doomsday has come for a number of companies, and they don't want to be on that list. And so they're seeing a lot more spending around that area, which is good because I think security has needed more spending uh, from that perspective as well. Go on to the next slide, if you would. Sure thing, and I think that's a great point that, digitization and the changes that are happening in the world around us are just maybe to use your analogy you know bringing that pot to a more rapid boil and companies all waking up and you can see here you know there's a couple of statistics that came out of the research that you know 97 percent of the executives that we spoke to said that they expect a rise in the number of attempts over just the next year and of course as a result, and you just talked about this, David, people are investing more in security over the next 12 months than they did over the previous. Absolutely. Great. And I'll jump to the next slide because this is another one that's um, I found it to be pretty interesting, and I'll look to get your comment on it, David, that, you know, I, I see a lot of companies who, you know, they tend to have a very rearview mirror kind of approach to vulnerabilities and issues, and 44% and of the executives we talked to said that the breaches are occurring even though they've already identified the vulnerability and that remediation is known. And so, you know, it's kind of a, it's a tough thing, but it, it sounds a lot like, well, we just didn't get around to fixing it. Um, and I don't know what you think, David, but in, in my experience, this number seems a little low, actually, that almost all of the people that I talk to who've had an issue, um, most of them are not in, you know, leading edge, day zero kind of type of exploits. They're existing exploits against vulnerabilities that maybe have been on the network or in their servers or their apps for a number of months. No, I agree. I think this number actually could be a little higher. Uh, from what I've seen in the past and, and from working with operations as a, as a CISO, I've, I've seen a situation where I'll identify a vulnerability using some sort of scanning technique or tool, and then I have to put it into the IT queue or the, or the software development queue to be fixed. And, and you know, they're, they're running as fast as they can to get stuff fixed. So I'm not trying to put any, any uh, negligence on, on their parts whatsoever, but they can only do so much, right? And so we do see a situation where there are numerous vulnerabilities out there that we've identified that everybody's trying to get into the queue to get fixed at some point in time. And it's just that moment, if the, if the attacker can get there, before you can fix that vulnerability that you know about, you know, you now have an incident, which is, which is a terrible thing to happen, of course, to any business. Uh, you know, I think that really is a, a tough situation to be in, and, and it comes down to tools and resources, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit in the, in the future, so I don't want to give away everything, but, but absolutely yeah. an issue. Yeah, yeah, agree. And now here's a, an interesting slide that you can talk to, David. Yeah, I, I have a couple of items here. I think that that lead us to the the situation that we were just talking about. Uh, the first one is from our from our AMA's data driven security report that I did earlier this year. We're seeing a decline in the ability of organizations to perform asset baselines and prioritization. And by assets, I mean that that can be hardware, software. They're looking at their IT environment and what's out there. So the systems that include hardware and software, and they're not getting to the point where they understand what their high priority assets are. And, and where they are and what their configurations are. So, so without that baseline, uh, that, that, you know, everything kind of kind of drops off. And, and if you could hit the next slide for me, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So we, we, we don't identify them, and then we also see a trend in the fact that we're not monitoring because we don't know what they are. And that comes from anything from shadow IT to additional services that are, that are, that are provisioned, uh, lack of tools, a, a lack of personnel. It could be any number of situations that cause this, but for whatever the reason in our particular organization, you know, we're not monitoring those high-value assets. So we're not creating the baseline, so we don't know where they are. Then we're not monitoring them. And then ultimately, if you switch to the next slide, you'll see the drop in security uh, overall. And I think this really kind of hits at home. The, there is a significant decline in security confidence over the last several years. So we've run this report between 2012 and 2015. It didn't run in 2013, so we have kind of a year gap over the four-year trend. But you can see in the beginning, we had 71% of the organization said we're, we're you know, uh, 
afraid that we may not be able to uh, identify an, an issue within our organization, a uh, security issue, before it creates a significant impact on the environment. And that went from 71 to 69, not a big significant change in terms of, uh, of statistics, if you will, but a jump from 69 to 79, which is a 10-point jump, uh, is very much significant. And that, that came right after the 2014 year of the breach, if you will. And, and so in this particular case, the question was, you know, what, what's your confidence? And 79% said they were only somewhat confident to, to highly doubtful that they could identify an issue uh, before it became a significant impact. And so you, you, hopefully you can kind of see that, that evolution there, uh, uh, everyone on the webinar, that, that if, we're not, if we're not identifying what's in our environment from a baseline perspective, we can't monitor it. And then ultimately we do have a decline in security confidence in our ability to identify these things before they cause us an impact. What do you think, Dave? Yep, I think that's really interesting data, and I, I think it kind of supports a lot of the same conclusions that I have, you know, from anecdotal conversations with customers and some of the research that we've done as well. Um, you know, one of the things that when I talk to customers, I try to always highlight the changing environment that we're working in. I try to educate them a little bit about some of the things that I'm talking with other customers on. And this one is one that I didn't think would be as surprising to folks as it is, but just, you know, the fact that in just about every meeting I go to, I'll update this slide and share it with folks. And they're, they're surprised at the number of new vulnerabilities month to month that are happening. You know, you can see from a point in October to a point in November, almost a thousand new vulnerabilities, around eight thousand a year. So to your point about not being able to baseline and, and not being able to catch things, it's exacerbated when the number of things that you need to catch is increasing the way that it is right now from a vulnerabilities perspective. Absolutely. The bar keeps moving, right? Exactly. And and you know, and this is the other um slide that I always like to talk about, and, you know, this is one of the things that really catches the operations team's eye as well as the, you know, the CISO or the security team, because when they think about, you know, around 80% of the attacks that, that are seen out there come from, uh, uh, are targeting a known vulnerability, and that 99% of those exploits were compromised over a 12-month period, it, it's, it's a wake-up call to the data that you just described. That's when I think, you know, and a lot of the times when I'm in the meetings, you can see the teams look across the table and they recognize, gosh, we're in this exact situation where maybe we're doing some vulnerability scanning and we have a little bit of insight, but we don't have a process in place where we're actively remediating issues in a timely manner. And so it's just a matter of time. It's not an if, it's a when this catches you. And, and, you know, that's obviously a bad situation. So, you know, when we talk to customers and when we talk to um, analysts and, and even through the research, there's a couple of trends that seem to pop up, you know, around why don't these vulnerabilities get addressed sooner. You know, and I think the first one is pretty obvious. There's this notion of visibility and, you know, visibility to understand not just that the vulnerability exists, but, you know, where in the environment it exists, what are the dependencies or interrelationships in that environment that you have to be careful of before you just run in there with the security patch and fix things. Because as we all know, if you're on the operations side, the, the, the number of times we've had a performance outage because we, you know, installed a security patch is, is pretty high. So there's some scar tissue there. There's some pain. So I think that between the lack of visibility, the lack of a process and some scar tissue or pain, because, you know, historically, the ops guys will point the finger at the security guys as a root cause for performance issues. That, that makes it tough. And then you combine it with one of the hard things that a lot of people don't know much about and overlook. And that is that, you know, downtime is rare. And, if you're working in a you know production data center environment, you don't have a lot of opportunity to do large jobs where you're patching servers and updating application middleware components. And so scheduling and prioritizing which vulnerabilities get fixed in which maintenance window, it sounds like an easy thing, but when we actually looked into it with our customers, we found it was a, an area of, of tremendous waste. A lot of time is being spent just figuring out what's vulnerable, what priority I should put on it, and when can I actually get the fix done. And that 
in some ways adds up to the 193 days you see here on this slide. Absolutely. David, I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you on, on all three of these aspects in terms of impacts of the business and, and frustration from, from the internal side, especially when you start talking about organizations uh, in downtime. You know, you're trying to get three, four, five nines of availability, and, uh, you know, complexity also impacts us when we're trying to make changes and stuff uh, in, in our networks. And I have some, some information on that on the next slide. But, but I think that the downtime is really a difficult one because you're trying to schedule downtime, but at the same time uh, you can have downtime based on a lack of visibility or a lack of, or excuse me, or an increase in complexity. Yep, yeah, agree. And let's jump to that next slide. Uh, so, so one of the things I wanted to bring out here uh, were specifically on visibility and complexity uh, around uh, tools, right? So, so we asked organizations, uh, what you know, what what are your frustrations with uh, with tools, and where do you find a lack of value? And the number two answer was the tools don't provide adequate correlation of data to business impact. So, so that to me is a visibility issue, right? We 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 under, we don't understand uh, when we're going to do something, what impacts downstream if we're going to take this tool offline or take this database offline or application, whatever it is, right? Or if we need to make a change to our routing infrastructure, uh, we don't necessarily understand what the business impact is. So we may have it scheduled, we may have it documented, we flip the switch, and all of a sudden we have that big oops moment where we realize more stuff went down or was impacted than we thought it was. Um, the uh, Number five there also says tools do not provide enough visibility to the ways threats appear right, and propagate. So, so another visibility issue we have there with being able to understand how threats are getting into our environment, how they're proliferating and moving laterally, whatever, whatever term you want to use. So, so that's another issue we're having. In terms of uh, the complexity, the last two major bullets, uh, you know, the information I have, 90% of outages are caused by unscheduled or, or undocumented changes. So those are the two issues that we have where someone tries to, and they're very tightly rated because someone can be trying to fix a problem that was raised to them. They're doing a favor for their buddy over in IT or, or application development or whatever, and they, or even for a customer, and they inject a change into the system to try and resolve something, and we, we create a new problem. Right? We saw that uh, habitually, for example, in Microsoft in patching uh, in the late 90s and to, to early 2000s, right? They'd release a patch and they'd fix whatever it was they were supposed to fix uh, most of the time, uh, but then all of a sudden, boom, right? We'd, we'd see some other issue where desktops were impacted or other systems were impacted uh, based on that particular change. And they've gotten much better about that in documenting the way that they're, they're doing their changes so their patches don't cause, uh, you know, collateral damage uh, for, the, for the most part as well. So that's very good. Um, you can see no, you can see also uh, it looks like I duplicated an item there by accident on my slide didn't catch that but but uh, that also falls under the visibility right of, of business impact if we're going to make a change we need to understand what's going on we have to document our changes uh, and we also have to schedule them appropriately so we don't cause uh, impact uh, with complexity specifically on the last bullet right that really is the bane of operations as well as security but but definitely of security because we find that uh, as we in increase complexity in our security solutions and in our security tools we have additional uh, you know collateral problems if you will those those non uh, non documented issues and, and the first one with tools is if we buy a tool that's supposed to be the the end all be all greatest thing in the world uh, and it, and it doesn't solve the problem appropriately uh, due to complexity or other issues, right? Let's let's hope it's not from a lack of of uh, developing our, our requirements and so forth. But it becomes shelfware. So now we've spent money on something. The boss is expecting it to be doing a job, and it's really not doing much of anything. It may be deployed to some degree, uh, but it's not fully deployed, uh, or it may just sit there and not be deployed at all. So now we have a lack of ROI, a return on investment for uh, for the organization for something they've spent. And then we see with uh, security architectures and, and architectures in general, whatever it is, if we create a very complex system, we have security gaps. So we, we can't fully test everything. The more complex we make the, uh, the system, the less ability we have to do full regression testing and, and, and iteration testing on the system. And so then we have security gaps and possible failures. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, I think a couple of comments that I'd make. One is, you know, tying all of this back to change management, um, you know, and tracking is important. But, you know, like you said, it's, it's as important to follow those change management processes around business impact or change review and change advisory boards because I do hear a lot of, you know, well, we, we couldn't test that security fix as adequately as we wanted to, so we rolled it into the environment. And that's where we learned, and that's where we had some of those 
you know, undocumented or un, unplanned issues. Um, and I think absolutely agree on the tools and the complexity points. So, you know, back to the view of what's happening in the market, you know, a lot of this is, and, and I've spent a little bit of time learning about and focusing on the DevOps equation, a lot of this is very similar in that you've got operations and their focus on, you know, three nines or five nines or whatever the availability metrics that you're being held to are, you know, you're prioritizing performance, especially in this new digital world, you know, where, where people are going to hit your, your app or your website. And if it's not performing well, they're, they're not going to spend much time. They're going to jump to something else because there are other options. And so the operations teams are highly motivated to focus on the downtime reduction, whereas the security team is actually, you know, trying to be more secure and, and close that window around the vulnerability. So there's a little bit of a mismatch here, the same way with, you know, application developers and operators where app dev just wants to go fast and operations are the guys who've got to try and manage risk and control things. Um, and so it's, a, it's an interesting and uh, kind of similar analogy there to the DevOps world. Um, you know, and we have this slide that talks about um, a three-pronged approach to fixing this because, you know, like all things, when we're talking about how do you solve these problems, it, it's never a tool and it's never, um, you know, a new technology. It, it typically is the application of a tool and some new technology to uh, either a new approach um, or a new organizational structure. And so one of the things that we've talked to a lot of companies about is more tightly aligning the goals so that system reliability and availability and performance is balanced with system security, because that's a big gap, as I talked about in the previous one. Um, and I think another one, and, and this is uh, one I'll ask you to talk a little bit about, David, is you know people are beginning to go through some, some transformative stuff around org structures and the processes they use whether it be using cloud environments or best practices from web scale IT or even DevOps, we've seen a lot of companies who are looking at new processes and organizing in new ways. And then certainly, you know, there's a lot of new technology and new tooling that, you know, if used appropriately, can provide previously unavailable views into information and help with the decision making and, you know, where appropriate, automation can take over and provide that consistent change that, you know, people are looking for. David, over to you. Any comments on the people process tools stuff? No, no absolutely. I, I think you're, you're, you're spot on there from that perspective. Uh, people are a foundational component uh, of, of our IT environments, right? They make decisions. They, they push policies, change policies, et cetera. Uh, but ultimately, we have to make sure that the people are given enough information so they can they can make those correct decisions. And when you get down to processes and technology, if either one of those two are not correct, right? If you have a bad process, if it's if it has uh, faulty gates in it, or if it has um, uh, delay times, or or you know whatever the case may be, or or if it ha or if it's missing the other, if it's missing the quality gates and things like that, of course we can introduce problems into our environment. So we have to look at that. And I think ultimately technology is meant to reinforce those two. Because before we can deploy a piece of technology, we have to understand what the issues and requirements are in our environment. And that's why there's not just one of everything uh, in terms of uh, technology stacks in the world. There's competing technologies because different environments have different requirements. And then you, you base your, your, your buy decision off of those technology requirements that you have that meets, you know, whatever it is, 80, 90 percent of, the, of the, the number one goals that you have. Uh, if you don't do that due diligence first, you're, you're shooting in the dark, right? So, so absolutely, each one of these three plays a key component in both security and operations. Yep, and here's a slide that you have on people. Yeah, so one of the things that we identified, and, and to make this less anecdotal, right, people talk about, oh, there's millions of security jobs available and there's zero unemployment or, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, we asked the organizations in our data-driven security report what, what kind of people problems they're having. And so 68% said they're having some kind of staff problem. Excuse me, whether that's an actual shortage where we can't fill a position or whether it's we're, we're able to find people that seem adept, we're going to fill them with less skilled uh, you know, people, uh, or uh, they're getting people, but they're having a high amount of churn. And I thought that was very interesting as well, that 25% were, were able to find staff. 
uh, but they were having a high amount of churn. And really what happens is, unfortunately, is the folks with the less amount of dollars, your, your SMB and your, and your mid-market organizations, or at least your low-mid-market organizations, they'll bring people in, they'll train them, and, and then the, the folks with the bigger pocketbooks will steal them away once they have some, some training. And so uh, that, that creates a, a big issue with both people and processes uh, in that situation, because if you have an organizational churn, you're not gaining that tribal knowledge, if you will. So if you don't have well-documented processes that you can point someone to, you're not going to have the people in place that say, oh, yeah, I've been here for five years, and this is how we do it, and this is, it works well, and get, to give that uh, hands-on training, if you will. And then if it's not written down, you're redeveloping the wheel every time you have a new person or new people come in. So I think this is a, a big issue that we're experiencing across the board. Yeah, I agree, and I'll throw in a little color commentary that I think one of the other things that my customers have sometimes had to deal with is the demand, um, you know, is out there. And, and so one of the things that we've been hearing is that, you know, if you're, if you're working at one of the hot startups or if you're working at one of these unicorn or, you know, really exciting new companies, you know, Netflix is always an example because everybody knows Netflix and, streaming videos is a pretty cool project, um, they tend to get the lion's share of the best staff. And so that's another angle here is that, you know, traditional industry and traditional business is struggling somewhat just from a perspective um, problem. You know, people's perspective is they want to go work at the cool new hot startups or the big, you know, game-changing companies. They don't want to go back into insurance or banking or some of the, the big old-school businesses, and I think that exacerbates what we're seeing here. Yeah, I think also with reference to your to your to your last slide, we can we can stay here. But I I think that if you think of the old develop uh, analogy where you have where you have what is it cost, speed, and quality, right? It's a three-legged stool, and you have any two, but you can't have you can't have three. Uh, right. I think that comes back to people, processes, and technology as well. If you're lacking people, but you have strong technology and strong processes, you can make it. No, 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 no big problem. And, and the same is true with any, anything else. If you have good people and good processes, but your technology is not so good, you'll probably be okay. But if you break any two of those, right, you're 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 done. So, yeah. so that's a, a, a critical issue as well. And, and I think that's where we we come into the, the content on this particular slide with integration and scalability. So with the with the tool aspect. Um, we, we, we can't just throw people at, at the situation, right? We, we've got to have two. So it, let, let's say we, we don't have enough people. That's a given. So now we have to work on our process and our tooling. And we find that uh, within that, integration and scalability are key because we, 95% of organizations, for example, on the, first, on the second bullet, said that uh, you know, we, we have 10 or less people working security. FTE is full-time equivalent. Right? And so uh, given that environment, we're also seeing more than 100 uh, severe critical incidents that come into our queue via whatever mechanism per day. And, and there's almost no way for those 10 individuals to track and, and resolve all of those if they're getting that compounded rate per day, plus all of the non-severe critical ones that they have to deal with. Uh, and so we do have to have a, a better tooling since we can't increase people you know, ad infinitum. Uh, additionally, 70% of scalability of automation, uh, 70 percent of the uh, individuals that we surveyed said that scalability and automation are important to meeting compliance needs. And, and we know that compliance isn't going away. It's not going to get any less. It's probably going to continue to get more stringent uh, and, and more, uh, more regulated across more industries as we continue to have breaches. Uh, and so if we don't have scalability of, of tools, that's going to be a problem. And if we don't have automation, uh, that's a problem. When you put those two together, what you're talking about is the ability of a tool to start small, of course, and be able to deal with whatever outcomes that you've defined in your, in your uh, policies and then be able to implement those in some fashion. And one of the things that we, we see also from an automation perspective that people uh, are hesitant about is, is I kind of define this between automated and automatic. Uh, and depending upon what you're doing, Everybody likes automated, which means that, that I, I, as a person, can say, yeah, there's a problem, I agree with this situation, and I'm going to push a button of some kind and make something happen in the system. So that's automated. I don't have to type in commands manually. I don't have to create a script for it. There's already some infrastructure there to make it happen. Automatic people uh, are warming up to, but it's still a little hesitant. And automatic means the system identifies an issue and then is able to go out and correct it and then let you know, hey, I saw a problem, I fixed it, here's, here's the outcome of that. Uh, they're a little more hesitant in that area uh, because of having been burned in the past, if you will. Uh, a great security example of that comes from the early days in the, uh, in the early 2000s when Checkpoint and Cisco created a partnership so that the Checkpoint firewalls could update the Cisco IDSs. 
and, and it sounded like a great idea, and it was going to be awesome and fantastic. But then the attackers learned that if they spoofed an IP address, sent a few bad uh, packets over to the IDS, you could have the uh, IDS automatically block out uh, a core supplier or a partner or a customer uh, and cause business outages that way. And so they, everybody kind of quickly withdrew that automated process. Um, so we have to be careful of that. But with, with scalability and automation, we have to make sure they're in place at the appropriate levels and, and, and really evaluating the tools that we have from a scalability perspective. And the last bullet there, 93% of the organization said integration is important for security. Uh, we've seen this in a couple different surveys that we've done in research projects, uh, various different types of questions. But, but ultimately, uh, we know that uh, we have various solutions out there, especially in security. The problem that we have is we have very compartmentalized solutions for many things, and they want to work in their own silos. So being able to have either a central tool that does more, more breadth across it, right, that, that, that's, uh, I won't say a suite, but it's a tool that has more capabilities, or having the integrations between tools to be able to function is, is highly critical from a, a business needs perspective. Your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, when we talked earlier about the people problem, you know, that, that is an obvious one. And then you combine that with the fact that we had kind of identified that there's a process problem and a tooling issue. I think this is, you know, a, an obvious slide. And I uh, agree completely around the concept of integration and scalability. And I joke with some of my own customers that they've, installed push button automation in, in response to your automated versus um, automatic, you know, because a lot of the times there is still a desire for a human to review the change or, you know, actually deliver the change through the software versus having it just run completely in the background. Um, and I think that's a, as you said, it's a maturity discussion. And over time, customers will figure out the right level of maturity for their environments. Absolutely. And so here we are on from organizational. Yep. And so additionally, what we're seeing out there in, in terms of the research is, uh, for example, the first bullet up in the upper left-hand corner. 87% of the organizations that we talked about said scalability is important with dealing with vulnerability management. Uh, this is absolutely hands down one of, the, one of the biggest issues we see. We're not talking about anything super special or, or APTs or day zeros or throw out, throw out all the acronyms. We're just talking about basic block and tackling from a vulnerability management perspective. Even small organizations that have on-site data centers or have hosted data, uh, they're, they're struggling with vulnerability management. Uh, as, you, as you showed earlier, well earlier in your slide, the bar keeps moving. We, we're increasing by you know, 8,000 vulnerabilities or more a year. So, so even if you're, if you're on pace, you're falling behind. You have to figure out how to increase that pace. So scalability of a vulnerability management system is, is absolutely imperative. And that's not just for scanning vulnerabilities, because that's really, the, the, relatively speaking, we'll say that's the easy part. There's plenty of tools out there that will do, do uh, broad-based scanning for various, whether it's application scanning, Internet scanning, or so forth. But it's how do you actually understand uh, how to prioritize and deal with those vulnerabilities once you have them identified. Uh, and I think that's where we really we do fall down. We talked about those handoffs between security and operations uh, or even security and software dev uh, and, trying to, uh, and trying to get those vulnerabilities uh, managed. So we have to have a scalable tool that will help us to, to uh, keep them in one place, prioritize, manage, monitor, uh, and so forth. Right. And then we see on the upper right-hand side, 88% of the individuals that we surveyed said integration is important for vulnerability management. And that's absolutely true as well, because if I have to go and update vulnerability information on individual assets, right, those systems, uh, or in individual uh, ticketing systems or uh, application systems and so forth, that can be a, a harrowing job in and of itself. That could take all kinds of man hours. In fact, it will take all kinds of man hours to do. And so the integration between the systems to move that information on status and changes and so forth is absolutely imperative. In the bottom left-hand corner, 71% said the ease of use is important for vulnerability management. I've used some very interesting tools over the course of, of time, and, and most of the, uh, let's, say the, let's say, like the scanning tools and things like that, they've really developed their, their GUIs and other, uh, other capabilities uh, very well over time to make them very easy to use. Uh, on the other side, though, with trying to, to manage what happens after you identify the vulnerability, uh, that's going to be a key aspect of tools that are going to be adopted because otherwise, again, we're going to have shelfware and then you're going to have dissatisfied customers. 
In the bottom right-hand corner, 82% said scalability is important for automation solutions. And we talked a little bit about the, those two aspects uh, in, in the previous slide. But, but absolutely, if you're going to automate and you're dealing with you know, 10 systems or 50 systems or 100 systems, that's probably not a big deal. Right? But when you start talking about thousands, tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands of systems from either a physical and or a virtual perspective, scalability is paramount because there's no way that we're going to do it by hand. What do you think? Yeah, and I see the, you know, the human scale problem as the number of vulnerabilities increases and the number of systems that teams are trying to management increases. And, you know, in some cases we even have talked to customers about how far behind the scans they are. You know, the, the security team is scanning regularly and the operations team is still trying to fix stuff that was identified three, four, five scans ago. Um, so I think you're right, scalability and, um, you know, important for vulnerability management and automation. Um, as is the, you know, the integration point, obviously, we talked a little bit about that and the ease of use point. Um, you know, I think that's just become a, a part of the digital world we live in is that, you know, almost everything nowadays has to have a intuitive, easy-to-use approach. So on this slide, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is just some of the benefits that customers are seeing from automation of this style, this concept that, you know, we at BMC talk about as SecOps. So you can see at the top, 38% of the North American and 44% of the European executives that we talked to said that they see kind of new technologies as really important. Um, you know, 62% of them, this one's an obvious one, said that they, they're looking for tools to figure out, you know, will a patch result in downtime? How can we better patch our infrastructure in an intelligent way that doesn't impact performance? Clearly an operational angle there. But I thought the next two were really interesting. You know, 60 and 59% want tools that are more focused on, um, you know, corrective actions and automation based on events or context. And... 59% valued a centralized view, and you know, and, and going a layer deeper, this is one of the areas that, pre, you know, we don't believe too many customers have a central view of what the vulnerabilities are that exist in the environment. You know, what has the trend been over time, and what's the remediation plan for those vulnerabilities that do exist? Um, and that last bullet's a. Uh, you know, both a great one for us as a, a, a technology vendor and, and an analyst firm in this market, but I think it's also, it ties right back to that early data that we were talking about, that security is kind of coming out of a check-the-box world to, uh, hey, I want to be world-class in the way that I do security for my digital assets, my data center assets, you know, my whole company. All right, so moving to the next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about BMC's solution in this area. So just a couple of quick overview slides so that you all get a better understanding of our capabilities and the value we provide. You know, so the first step that we talk about is, is really based on core automation. Um, and we talk about relentless remediation. So this is the ability to eliminate the threats that exist in your environment in an automated, consistent fashion and, you know, re in reality, what we're trying to address here is that 193 days that we talked about, about, you know, roughly how long a vulnerability stays in your environment from the time you found it to the time you fix it. Um, so, so doing things like automatically correlating the scan data that highlights where you are vulnerable to the inventory or system of record and tying that back to the patching mechanism so that you can quickly view and filter and prioritize those systems that you want to fix first. Maybe they're specific business services or applications that are critical to your business, or maybe there's a specific vulnerability that, that your firm wants to make sure it remediates quickly. You know, Heartbleed as a, an example of, uh, from the not too distant past. And then schedule those remediation actions into your maintenance windows. And let's do that not just for your servers, but also for your network devices as well. And then at the end of the day, let's also make sure we tie back 
to your change management or your system of record and update it that you have actually addressed this vulnerability so the security guys can get notified that you know you did your job from an operations perspective. Um, and so this closed loop automation is really, really important. And, and as I said, this is one part of the value prop just around relentless remediation. You know, you know David, then, David on, on that particular slide as well, I, I think, you know, you're absolutely correct. Having a closed loop system is, is imperative for vulnerability management and that whole SecOps and, and ops, uh, a circle, cycle of life, if you will, because I have seen so many times in previous environments, but the, both that I've uh, been a part of and, and consulted with, that, that they didn't have that. And so their, their uh, change management database or their, their asset database became out of date uh, and, and became worthless, right? So they spent all this time putting information in the database, but they didn't uh, right. uh, upkeep it properly, even from a security perspective, because they didn't have that, that closed loop ability. So no one really knew what the situation was at any given time, and you had to draw custom reports, and so you're back to that whole wasting man hours, and you have to create new processes and overhead. So having that closed loop system is absolutely uh, an imperative. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, you know, you, at some level, the culture of heroes that it takes when you don't have the closed loop system, it just breaks down, whether because the process or the complexity or the lack of skilled people that we talked about earlier. Um, totally agree there. You know, so the, the, you know, the, one of the questions that a lot of customers ask us around remediation specifically is, you know, is it just vulnerabilities? And, you know, in a lot of cases, the answer is no. We see customers who are trying to attack this both from a compliance perspective and from a security vulnerability, you know, threat perspective. And so you can see that, you know, more than 52% of the enterprise customers that we talked to in the research equated that regulatory compliance almost as foundational or alongside, you know, tighter security. And so we, we see a lot of cases where a, a customer may do an automated fix because an environment that got spun up for a new application or, or got reconfigured now falls out of the PCI compliance or the HIPAA compliance or, you know, whatever compliance regime, the internal audit that they may care about. And you can see here that that is the second part of the um, value prop is that, you know, we're helping you be audit ready all the time, you know, vigilant compliance, understanding not just the vulnerability side of the equation, because that's certainly an event that, you know, when you find a vulnerability, as we've talked a lot about, that, that we've got to get better as a, an industry at addressing. But as I said, similarly, compliance, you know, it follows a, a, almost the same process where instead of doing a vulnerability scan, you're doing a compliance scan or a compliance policy check, and then you're identifying a bunch of changes that need to be made in order to stay in compliance. So um, really helping customers in those two areas is a strength of ours and a big part of the value prop here. And then the last yep. slide. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and, you know, I was going to say, and having that in one place, I mean, I've had plenty of environments where I've had different systems that have been uh, either manually or, let's say, semi-automatedly put that information together. But having it in one tool in one place, it, it was absolutely a dream from, from an operations perspective uh, to be able to, to, to keep that going and, and, and condense it, understand it, and move through the, that process. Yeah, you know, David, we did a bunch of customer research, and that was one of the things that just screamed out of the research is that they were having to spend so much time getting ready for audits, proving that they had done work around security or compliance. Um, and so we just felt like it was kind of a natural thing for us to solve, given the, you know, the places our products were in. Um, and, and the value has been interesting because more and more advanced customers are coming back and talking to us about, you know, the risk metrics that they use and how they can use information from our systems to populate some of their KPIs and dashboards uh, around security risk or around, you know, those audit reports for compliance officers. And you can see right here that this is criteria that we found the decision makers are very, very focused on. They want to be able to have good compliance reports that are easy. I mean, that's an obvious one. They, they all feel it's important to integrate into the service desk and the change management processes that exist. Um, and, and of course, they want some level of flexibility so that they can tailor the solution because, you know, everybody treats certain vulnerabilities differently and 
certainly there are parts of the compliance world that, you know, maybe apply and other parts that don't. So um, these were things that the research pointed out that, that I think support the value prop we laid out. And then, you know, just uh, another point around customer success and what we've seen, you know, to your comment, David, about that that is a dream. Well, the, the state of Michigan was able to reduce the time for audit report creation from, you know, 32 hours to 15 minutes, which, you know, if you go talk to the, the team there that had to do that work, they're really excited because it used to be a whole bunch of log file analysis and spreadsheet number crunching from 15 different systems, and now they're able to go to one spot, hit the summary report button, do a quick review, and send that off to their auditors. And you can see two other examples, Fujitsu, reduced time for server provisioning from a couple of months down to a few days, and Aegon reduced almost 9,000, more than 9,000 staff hours by remediating almost 100,000 events. And so another example of kind of event-based automation where a security vulnerability came through or a compliance issue came through or uh, a maintenance you know, request came through, and they were able to automate the back-end work. Um, I think those are real powerful examples of what customers can do with these type of solutions. So those, are, those are some really good numbers. I mean, you think that was it 32 hours or 15 minutes is something like a 1,200% uh, improvement. And I, and I know when I was getting ready for my PCI audits, uh, I, I dreaded those, those, uh, those times <laughs> because it would take, you know, a minimum of a week to get things together for, uh, for several of my team members, including myself, plus some other activities we had to do on an ongoing basis. So that, would, that is absolutely fantastic. Yep, yep. I've talked to many customers who talk about the week of prep before the audit where, you know, they lose half their team because <laughs> everyone's <laughs> running around getting ready. Yep. <laughs> well, you know, that's the end of our session. And from a timing perspective, we did pretty well. Um, so at this point, uh, Raleigh, I'll turn it back over to you so that we can start with the Q&A. Great. Thank you, David. And I wanted to invite our audience to um, check out the full survey results. You can check out the results at the URL provided here. I will also include this link in the follow-up email going out tomorrow. Starting with you, David Monahan, the first question is, how are you applying the term scalability to vulnerability management? Well, I, th I think we addressed that to some degree, so, but I, I think uh, really it, it's about being able to uh, address uh, a large scale of systems and the overlaying large scale of, of vulnerabilities. Because each, each system we, we come across, very rarely do we have just one vulnerability on a system, at least, an, uh, let's say, an early to mid program, if you're, if you're able to be very rigid and programmatic. So, so in terms of scalability with vulnerability management, it, it's about being able to, to address, monitor, track, uh, and uh, manage, resolve, and report on the vulnerabilities themselves and the systems over time as the numbers of systems and vulnerabilities expand and contract. Uh, you, you can't just do it on a spreadsheet anymore. Thanks, David. Now jumping over to David Kramer. Does pervasive use of open source technology make these problems better or worse? What are you seeing? Well, I think I wouldn't necessarily say it's a better or worse discussion. I would say that, you know, pervasive use of open source would maybe make the problem more complex. You know, that's, that's more third-party libraries and more open platforms that are changing regularly that you're going to have to keep up with from a vulnerability and compliance perspective. Um, but I, I don't think that, that I'd say there's any, you know, positive or negative to using open source software, as it were, just that, you know, the more open source platforms, the more platforms in general, and the more open source tooling that you're using, um, you know, as I said earlier, just it creates a little bit more complexity. And, you know, as David said earlier, having multiple tools to do the same problem in a lot of cases results in some lower ROI because you end up with tools that are, you know, poorly implemented or implemented to just do one little job, and so there's maybe not as good an ROI. Yeah. I think also, David, part of that is, is when you're using open source tools, um, people often forget about the, the amount of human input that has to go into making some of these tools operate and to integrate them as well. 
right? Most, most of the times, uh, open source tools, someone created it because they had a particular pain point, and so it solves a particular problem, but it doesn't necessarily fit exactly the problem that you have, and so you have to get two or three open source solutions, glue them together somehow, and now you're responsible for the middleware as well as the, uh, the application support, and that can create some complexity in the environment as well. Yeah, agreed. And the people aspect, you know, further complicates it. When you, when you use a lot of open source tooling, one of the things I've seen is that you tend to have a larger number of specialist resources in your environments who are the experts at those tools. You know, they're familiar with the, the programming languages or the interfaces or the, the best approaches to using them. As you said, a lot of those tools are powerful, but, you know, sometimes they're, they're focused and so they require you to blend them with other tools to get the job done. Thank you both for that clarification. Staying with you, David Kramer, how would you recommend beginning down the path you're recommending? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I think, you know, what we've seen with our customers is typically the, the, the pilot project tends to be, you know, with a customer who's identified that, yes, they're currently scanning their environment for vulnerabilities. and you know, they're struggling. And so the, the way that we talk about beginning is, you know, picking a section of your environment and trying to look at that process to identify both the gaps in the process and the areas where you need to get improvement. You know, and that's something that, you know, obviously we're willing to help customers along the path with, but that's something that seems to work. You know, start small, kind of pilot the project, bring in people from both the security side and the operational side, um, you know, and obviously make sure we address the alignment issue around the people. That You know, the, the last thing you want to do is get in a situation where the teams are misaligned, you know, where operations is focused on one thing and security on the other, and the two don't kind of meet in the middle. Great. Thank you. Jumping back over to you, David Monahan, you mentioned that organizations are having trouble identifying key assets. Why is that true? now more so than in the past if budgets are increasing and there are better tools available? I think part of it comes down to the separation between security and operations uh, because even though budgets are increasing, uh, there's still not unlimited resource, whether that's money or, or people. So when you have that, that separation between operations and security, they're, they're, they are competing for those budget dollars. And, and then let, let's say I, I do get a huge influx of, of capital in, or in, into my security budget. Do I have the people to be able to deal with that as well? And we talked a little bit about that. So I can buy a great tool, but if I don't have the resources to implement it from the operations side or from the security side or to manage it, uh, we're having problems there. And I, and I think that's what we're coming into. I think that people gap is, is definitely affecting us from, from what we're seeing in our research. Uh, it's not just about the budgets. Uh, additionally, I think, I think I mentioned shadow IT. We're, we're having a huge influx uh, of shadow IT, IT organizations being uh, you know, weighted down with processes in the business. You're seeing individuals going out and buying cloud services, and then IT and or security don't know they exist or are only loosely familiar with the fact that they exist. They're not scanning them and so forth. So uh, I think that, you know, that becomes a key asset. If someone starts using it in the organization and let's say it, it begins to build a little momentum uh, for whatever reason they, they gathered it, now we have an asset that we're not managing, monitoring or managing uh, from a security perspective that could very well be a data leak or data breach uh, aspect. So there's a, quite a few areas in there that can, that can impact us. And staying on the theme of budget, this individual wants to know, how do we get upper management and budget holders to support these projects? Well, I, I think from, from my perspective and in my successes in the past, it, it really comes back to kind of standard tactics, but, but maybe with, with a better approach. Uh, business people understand risk. Uh, they understand cost, right? So, so how can you make the needs and the pain that you're feeling attributable to a specific and quantifiable risk, and, and then how can you identify a cost savings or a cost avoidance? Right? A cost savings means I'm, I'm going to be able to keep money that I was going to spend, 
uh, versus a cost avoidance means I'm not going to spend more in the future based on expected growth or, or whatever. And, and both of those are aspects that business people really can't argue with. If you come in with a sound foundation of, you know, I'm going to spend $8,000 or $2,000 or $100,000, whatever it is, on these solutions, and you can say, here, that means I don't have to hire these people. That means I've re- I'm going to be able to reduce the risks this much faster or, or the risks I couldn't even approach before uh, and, and so forth. These, these are aspects that business folks understand. If you just come in and say, the sky is falling and we've got 4,000 vulnerabilities and it's terrible, they don't know how to equate that into, into real risk numbers and finance numbers. So you, so you really have to have effective middle, uh, middle managers that can, that can change geek speak, right, from a 1,000 vulnerabilities into management speak of, here's the quantifiable risk in dollars that are associated with this. Do you have any thoughts, David? Thanks. Yeah, I do. I, th- I totally agree with what you said, and then I'll reiterate what I said earlier. The, the key to success is the, the pilot project. You know, a lot of the times, one of the reasons that I see, um, you know, the internal teams who are trying to solve a problem stall out or fail when they go up the management chain is that they haven't painted the negative present, the picture of how bad it is that, we, you know, the world we live in today, and then the positive future. And typically those small pilot projects are, are exactly what you can use to do that, you know, to show that it took you, you know, 30 minutes to get the audit report instead of five hours, or, or that it took you, you know, uh, only a couple of hours to remediate a bunch of known vulnerabilities instead of a couple of weeks or months previously. Yeah. You and know, that, one of the other things that, just – oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to comment back that it, it ties back to exactly what you were saying about, you know, making sure you translate the pitch up the chain into business speak, you know, trends and things that the business person cares about. We're more safe and secure. We can see a trend that we're reducing vulnerabilities faster, and that's a good thing, versus, you know, automation technology that they may not completely understand. Yeah, one of the things that came to me and one of the contexts I had uh, in, a, in a previous life in working towards getting a security product in place was I was able to get the other managers from a network and desktop and, and so forth on board uh, because I was able to show them how that solution would impact them in a positive manner and help them to do their jobs better as well. When you can find solutions like, like this, right, right from, uh, that, that help you from an operations management perspective as well as a security perspective, why shouldn't the ops guys want to be on board and, and, and hopefully contribute budget to that as well, you know, or at least not request other budget that you may be competing for and say, hey, you know, here's how we're going to help your life. So, so that's absolutely another, another tactic that's very, very useful, valuable, and, and real uh, that, that, can, that can help you, you know, gain that, that management attention and uh, the, the budgets that you need if it is a competing budget issue. Excellent. Thank you both. That brings us to the top of the hour. I wanted to thank you all for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. Please do check out that email that you'll be receiving from EMA tomorrow. It will include the on-demand playback, a PDF of today's slides, a link to access the full survey results. So I hope you'll check that out. Thanks again for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day.